Y'all know me, I'm Dr. B, and this is The Buzz on Ringworm. Ringworm is also called tinea, that's what we call it. It's caused by yeast, and there are different types of tinea that affect different parts of the body. There's tinea corporis, or literally tinea of the body, tinea capitis, or tinea of the head, tinea cruris, also known as jock itch, which is tinea in the groin region, tinea pedis of the feet, and tinea versicolor, which is tinea that's widespread, usually over the chest or the back. Today, we're going to talk about ringworm on the body, tinea corporis. This is pretty common, maybe not as common as you'd think. A lot of people bring in a rashy kid, and it turns out to be eczema or some other problem. First, let's talk about what tinea corporis really looks like, get an idea of what we're looking for. The classic tinea corporis, or ringworm of the body, is a slow-growing round or oval lesion. Typically, these are red and have a little bit of scale to them, a little scaly. The edges will look like they're heaped up, so it's very well uh, circumscribed. It's well-defined because of that heaped-up edge. The larger it gets, it may show some central clearing, and you can see how the center of this looks like it's trying to get back to normal skin. And that's why we call it ringworm is because it has that red ring around what looks like a, a slowly clearing center. Often this is itchy. Kids will rub or pick at it. Usually there's just a few lesions that are clustered together. Sometimes there are quite a few together, especially if it goes untreated for a while, like in this kid who has it all over their chest. Not to a doctor or people who've seen a lot of tinea before. These pictures are pretty obviously tinea, but it can be a lot more subtle. Sometimes it may just be a large peely area or an area with a change in pigmentation. The problem with tinea is that it can look like a lot of other things. We call it a great mimicker. It mimics a lot of other problems. So let's look at some of those, see if we can tell the difference. Eczema or atopic dermatitis can have a ring shape. And this is especially common in numular eczema, which, which means coin-shaped eczema. They're round. Uh, areas that are all scaly. Usually this is a lot of these. The kid has a history of allergies. One problem though is if you have eczema, you're at a little more risk of getting a ringworm infection. So sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between those two. Granuloma onulare. This is a ring-shaped uh, lesion that's usually seen on the hands or the feet. And this is, there's usually just one or two of these. This is ring shaped, but it's not scaly. You can see it has those heaped up edges and you think, man, that looks like, that looks like tinea, it looks like ringworm. But usually this, the skin does not look changed other than it's raised in this ring shape. It doesn't look scaly. And like I said, it's usually just on a hand or foot, whereas tinea can pr be pretty much anywhere. Pityriasis rosea, which is a viral caused rash, usually shows up on the torso, the front, and especially the back. You might have heard of the Christmas tree rash. It shows up in kind of a Christmas tree pattern on the back. The difference between this and tinea, these, can, these are oval lesions usually, so they kind of have a round shape, uh, but there's usually dozens and dozens of these on the back, and it's usually preceded by a cold. So that's how we tell those apart. Psoriasis can also have a ring-like shape. This usually has a silvery scale to it, and usually there's a, a chronic history of recurrent lesions like this. Um, and this is not as common as tinea, I would say, in children. Contact dermatitis is another type of lesion that can show up in a round shape. It depends on what the child is exposed to. This is caused by hypersensitivity reaction in the skin to something like maybe nickel or poison ivy or something like that. So sometimes you'll see a lesion that is round or, or maybe even ring-shaped. Uh, but what we have a history here of is exposure to something that would cause this rash. Finally, impetigo. You saw one of our recent videos on this. If you have bullous impetigo, like this picture, and this was actually one that we used in, our, in the lecture about impetigo, bullous impetigo causes a big blister that when it ruptures can leave a ring-like lesion. But this is usually scabby and wet looking. It's a little bit different from the dryness that you typically see with tinea. Transmission of tinea corporis can be between humans, so human-to-human -human contact, especially if kids are in close contact with each other, like in school or daycare or uh, older kids in dorms or in the military. Animal-to-human transmission can occur. 
animals can be a, a reservoir, what we call a reservoir for these kinds of bugs. Um, probably not as common in older kids, but younger kids who are around pets uh, can get tinea from a pet. Um, probably not as common as human to human uh, transmission, but it is possible. And then fomites can be a, a source of transmission. This fomite means something that's not alive, such as wet towels, uh, shower floors, uh, anything that might harbor this fungus. Diagnosis of tinea is usually based on history and exam, but we can also scrape the skin and look at it under a microscope. This is typically what a fungus looks like, this kind of budding, growing out from the center uh, bug. And a fungal culture can be done or something called a PCR test can be done, but you're really getting uh, pretty far down the line on that. Usually in the office, we just take a look at the kid, see what's been going on, uh, see how long it's been there, see how it's been growing, and make a diagnosis based on that. And one of the great things about tinea corporis is that you can treat this at home using over-the-counter medicines. And these are usually given for at least two weeks, maybe even up to four weeks. This is a slow growing infection. It's also a slow dying infection, unfortunately. But you can get these things over the counter or order them online at Walmart or wherever you get your medication from. Clotrimazole 1% cream. If you want to get a brand name, you want to be fancy, you can get Lotrimin makes a, a form of this. Clotrimazole is usually what we recommend trying first. And I recommend using this very often, three to four times a day. This is really cheap and you can get it just about anywhere in any drugstore or even the grocery store. Some fungal infections are starting to show resistance to clotrimazole or other azole drugs. So another one you can try is terbinafine, which I recommend using twice daily. And like I said, these medications you usually use for two to four weeks. Now, if the fungal infection is widespread, you don't want to keep chasing it all over with this cream, or if the child has an immune problem or something else that might uh, keep them from killing off this fungus, then we'll probably use an oral antifungal medicine. Terbinafine, which we just saw, has an oral form that we can prescribe. Also, itraconazole, also known as Spornox, is another medication that we might use. One very important point for treating these things at home, if your child has tinea, it might be red, it might be itchy, and you might be tempted to use a steroid on it, like hydrocortisone or cordate or cortisone 10 or something like that. In fact, a lot of the medications that are antifungals do have steroids in them for itching and redness. We do not recommend these. Do not use steroids on a fungal infection. Steroids, like over-the-counter hydrocortisone, can act like fertilizer on a fungus. So yeah, it'll stop itching and it'll be less red, but it's going to spread. And as soon as you stop using that medication, it's gonna get red and itchy and it's come right back. So we do not recommend using any steroids. This is what we call tinea incognito or disguised tinea. It should look like tinea, but it's been treated with a steroid and now it looks completely different. And that makes it very difficult to diagnose this. Unfortunately, this is how we often see kids in the office. They're pre-treated with a steroid and it makes it really difficult for us to tell what's going on. The kid in this photo was thought to have contact dermatitis, in which case the steroid actually might be the right move, but it turns out he didn't have contact dermatitis. He actually had a fungus on his forearm and when they use a steroid on it, that steroid fed the fungus and now it's out of control. So be careful and please don't use steroids on a fungus. Let us take a look at an, a mystery rash before you start treating it at home. Preventing tinea in the first place is probably more important than anything we've talked about today. So how do we prevent tinea? Good, healthy skin care is what we wanna do. We wanna keep the skin clean. We don't wanna dry it out too much. If they're dry areas, we wanna moisturize them, but we don't want the skin to be damp and exposed to moisture a lot. What fungus likes, remember, it likes darkness, it likes friction, it likes moisture. So you can think of someone who's been running around in a wet bathing suit, especially here in uh, Lake Oconee. Uh, someone who's been running around has wet socks and they're sitting in wet socks all day and they haven't changed their socks in a while. That's what fungus likes. So we want to keep the skin clean, dry, and healthy. Don't use harsh soaps either. Those can also dry out the skin. And if any areas look like they're dry or cracked, moisturize them with something like a nice cream or an ointment. Oh, and one last thing that I forgot to mention, band-aids. Don't use band-aids. A lot of people will have a tinea lesion, they'll put some antifungal medicine on there and put a band-aid on it so it doesn't spread. 
Well, that traps moisture on it. And like I said, fungus likes moisture. So you're kind of defeating the purpose of the antifungal medicine. Also, the adhesive in the Band-Aid can irritate the skin. An irritated, dry, cracked skin makes it easier for that fungus to spread out. So Band-Aids are a no-no in my book. Well, I hope you found something really useful today. If you liked us, uh, like this video, please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and we'll see you next time. Y'all know me, I'm Dr. B, and this has been The Buzz on Parenting and Pediatrics.